Welcome to episode 55 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lepore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lepore, I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you enjoy the show, please give us a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. That would be a big-time help. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you enjoy the content, we would appreciate it so, so much if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. All right, everybody. As of Monday, March 14th, 2022, the Toronto Maple Leafs have lost two games in a row and four of their last six. They are in a goaltending tailspin right now. They can't make a save if their life depended on it. Mrazek can't stop a beach ball. Campbell is injured right now, out with a rib injury. We are going to go over the last few days, all the things that happened in Leafs Nation, give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that went down with this team. But first, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lepore. How you doing, man? Anthony Bruno, thank you for having me. As always, doing well. Very excited to be on the pod with you today. Episode 55, shout out goes to the very first player in Maple Maple Leafs history to wear number 55, Drake Barahowski, who in my opinion is on two all-time Toronto Maple Leafs lists. Number one, who has the best name in Maple Leafs history. And number two, who has the best hair in Toronto Maple Leafs history, Drake Barahowski. Look up that hockey card from his draft day. He was drafted 10th overall by the Leafs. That's some hair, but he had some nice hair. And uh, he was a good player, man. Spent some time with the Buds. And I had no idea when I looked him up, he is now the head coach of the Orlando Solar Bears of the East Coast Hockey League. So solid NHL career. And now he's basking in some sunshine. Drake Barahowski was good at life, apparently. Awesome, Lepore. Love the shout out. Anytime you bring up a player who had good flow, that's a good, good selection. Laporte. Get amazing can't go here. Wrong. Yeah. All right, man. Before we get into the podcast, we have an announcement to make. We do. We actually notified the uh, best answers we thought for the Matthews and the McDavid Funko Pops. We responded to two to the two answers we thought were best. Um, so we're just waiting for those individuals to fire in some emails. So everyone jump on your YouTube. Uh, You'll have the alert that someone commented on one of your comments and uh, fire us an email with your mailing address and we'll get the Funko Pops out to you as soon as we can. Awesome. Yes. Just like Lepore said, we have reached out to the two winners for the Funko Pop giveaway contest. Check the YouTube comments. We have responded to your comments and you must send us an email as we notified you in the comment section. So we're really looking forward to sending those Funko Pops your way. Thank you for all the support, not just to the two winners, but to everyone in GFP Nation who follows this podcast. We appreciate you so, so much. All right. It is now time to jump in to the actual hockey. Time to talk about the Toronto Maple Leafs. Just a brief rundown of the last couple of games since our last podcast so the big news before these two games were even played is that jack campbell would be out a minimum of two weeks with a rib injury and we can get into that in a little bit more detail we will because i have some some thoughts and some opinions on that (laughs) so do i (laughs) but uh just to go over the week that was or not really the week that was but the two games since our last pod uh thursday march 10th In Toronto, the Leafs hosted the Arizona Coyotes. And, of course, the Coyotes won 5-4 in overtime. Very controversial call, or non-call, I should say, on Austin Matthews as he was held by Coyotes defenseman Jacob Chikrin, which led to Jacob Chikrin's overtime winner. (laughs) Because, of course, yeah. Of course, exactly. And, once again, the Leafs got egregious goaltending from Peter Mrazek, who allowed four goals on 12 shots. Eric Schalgren made yeah. his NHL debut and legitimately 
felt like he was Dominic Hasek. <laughs> yeah. You know, awful. compared to what the Leafs have been getting in net from Campbell and Morazic. So I mean, yeah, we can we can talk about Eric Schalgren, how he's gonna factor into the goaltending situation moving forward. I know it, it sounds insane. It well, he's the best goalie we have, Bruno. Named Eric so. Schalgren <laughs> might actually factor into the goaltending situation, but uh, this is where we are right now in Leafs Nation. But anyway, you would think the Leafs would bounce back from that in the Heritage Classic at Tim Hortons Field in Hamilton on Sunday. But uh, no, once again, Peter Morazic letting in some terrible goals. Uh, he allowed four goals on 37 shots. The Leafs lose 5-2 to Buffalo in the Heritage Classic, two losses in a row. Um, they're still on pace for a franchise record, 110 points, which is hilarious, Lapore. but this goaltending situation is an absolute mess. So just give me your thoughts on, on some of the things that we've seen from this team over those last two games. Well, I said it, I said at the end of the last podcast that I was really and truly hoping that we'd have something else to talk about because I don't know how many of our recent shows have just been about the Leafs not being able to make a save. It is full on ridiculous now. Someone posted the other day a list of the goalies with the worst save percentages in the NHL since January 1st. The Leafs had two of the top five. I think Morazic was second worst and Campbell was fifth worst. Actually, Jonathan Quick was the worst. But I think I stand where a lot of Leafs fans stand. And that is, I don't know what to say now. Because when something happens for a little blip on the schedule, you're thinking, ah, it's just something adjusting or it's something mental. The team's bored. The team's this. There's that. But no, now I don't know what to say. This is an ongoing thing. The level Morazic is playing at is comically bad. Those goals against Arizona, was it the first one that sort of hit his blocker and floated up and was jammed in? That's a pathetic goal. A pathetic goal. If my goalie let that goal in at Friday morning pick a hockey, I'd give him shit. Just ridiculous. And I'll say the word again, terrified. You mentioned we're still on pace for the best regular season in the history of the franchise. And as it stands right now, it's not going to matter because if this goaltending keeps going, we're not getting past the first round. It's absolutely impossible. If someone said the Leafs were going to get average goaltending in the first round, I'd say it's probably unlikely we're going to, we're going to advance this kind of goaltending. We wouldn't get past the first round of the OHL playoffs. And I'll just, you made the comment about Campbell and his injury. I'm going to throw it over to you for the seg because you're with one who, uh, who brought up like the, uh, the segue. So go ahead, Bruno, where were you going with that whole Campbell thing? Here's where I was going with the Campbell thing, because I saw so many comments on social media. And again, I'm more in the weeds than a lot of people, because you can find me on TikTok, You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Twitter. I'm always going through the comments section on Instagram. Same thing. I post a lot of content. I see what a lot of Leaf fans are saying, and I saw a lot of people basically blaming Campbell's poor play on this injury, as if he's been dealing with this injury for a long time. Yeah, but why don't thing. you actually go and read some of the quotes from Sheldon Keefe specifically, and even Jack Campbell for that matter, but let's, let's take a look at this quote from Sheldon Keefe, okay? Oh, no. I'm going to bring this oh, to everybody's no. attention. So he was asked point blank, if Campbell's injury contributed to his poor play. And here's oh. what Sheldon Keefe said. I don't think it's been around that long. Speaking of the injury, I don't think that's anything in play. In fact, he was himself feeling quite comfortable with where he's at. He's just aggravated it the other night, went for some testing and now going to need some time. So that's what Sheldon Keefe said, okay. basically saying that, He's not been dealing with this thing <laughs> during this entire cold streak where he's played like shit. Yeah. This thing has not really been an issue. And who knows? Maybe Jack Campbell was hiding it to a certain degree. This wouldn't be the first time that an athlete has maybe downplayed their injury. And maybe they don't reveal everything to the training staff because they want to be there for their teammates. They're competitive. You know, they understand especially in Jack Campbell's case, he understands that he's the number one goalie. This team is in the home stretch of the season. So who knows? But according to Sheldon Keefe, he said, 
Jack Campbell has not really been dealing with this injury for that long, and he's been feeling pretty good for the most part, and he just aggravated this the other night, and now he's going to need some time. So it appears that this injury was not lingering for very long, and I don't think that we can just blame his poor play on, oh, my God, he's been dealing with this rib injury for the last three months. No wonder he's been terrible. Again, it's probably been a factor, but I don't think it's been as big a factor as maybe a lot of people in Leafs Nation believe it was. So that's yeah. my take on the Campbell situation. I, I I hope he gets better, and I hope that, you know, maybe this injury was the thing that was derailing his season and that maybe when he does get back to full health, He's going to regain his form from earlier in the season, but that remains to be seen. But do you have a take on the Campbell situation at all, Lepore? Of course I got a take, Anthony Bruno. Okay. Uh, well, first things first, it brought me back to the year we signed David Clarkson. And of course, we all remember how poorly he was that first, how poorly he was playing that first year. And I remember thinking, please, God, let it come out that he's playing with broken ribs or something. So we have some justification for this. Now, with this Campbell thing and the take that his play has dipped because of some injured ribs, I hate to uh, break it to you, Leafs fans. That's some wishful thinking. That is some hard, wishful thinking. I'm going to go one step further, Bruno. I'm not even going to say that this is a minor thing that had nothing to do with his poor play or very little to do with his poor play. I don't even think he's hurt. Wow. I really, and, I really and truly don't think he's hurt. I think this team, this organization, the management, the coaching staff huddled up and said, we have to figure this the fuck out. I've said on this show many times that I truly believe it's between the years with Jack. There's no way a guy can go from that level. And I say, when I say that level, I'm referring to all-star level to where he's been at in the same year, just because all of a sudden he sucks at goalie. No, no, no. Between his ears is the problem. Right now, Jack Campbell is telling himself he's a terrible goalie. So this team need to get, need, needed to give him some time off so he can get his head straight. And I'm sure the help is there from the Maple Leafs because I'm sure they're sitting in that room saying the same things we are. We're on pace for 110 point season. We do not have a goalie. People often say when a team goes into the playoffs and eh, they don't really have a goalie, what that typically means is they have average goaltending. And oh, if they face Patrick Waugh or Broder, they're going to lose because that team has Patrick Waugh or Broder. No, 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 no. We really and truly do not have a goalie right now. And it is it would be the saddest thing in the world if this keeps going. And this is why this team is eliminated and why this season is ruined. So I think it was a look in the mirror for the organization. And I think they sat down and said, let's give Jack some time off. Let's, let's let him get his head straight or as best as we can try to let him get his head straight. We'll provide everything we need to provide because this is a nightmare right now. Nothing short of a nightmare. And I really don't think they're going to pursue a goalie. I can't. Like, people bring out those lists. Like everyone brings up Flurry. Flurry hasn't even had that good of a year. If you look at his numbers, to be fair, he's playing for the Blackhawks, who suck. But I mean, it's not like, oh my God, we've solved this now. But <sighs> scary. It's scary. And I hate to make a comment like that, saying that an organization and an organization I support is pulling something like this, but I just think the timing was too perfect that, Oh, he's got a rib injury and we're going to give him some time off. I don't think he's hurt, man. I don't think he's hurt. I think it's just a matter of him sitting down on that couch and talking to someone and figuring out how to get this guy to convince himself again, that he is a solid NHL goalie. I'm willing to take the team at their word and, Sure. I, I do believe that he probably has a minor rib injury. If he had broken ribs, he'd be out a lot longer than this. Right. But you know what, Lepore? I don't think you're alone. I really don't think you're alone. I think there's other people in Leafs Nation. I had a friend of mine who texted me something similar to what you just said, thinking that, you know what? I don't even know if Campbell's injured because you think about what happened even last season with Freddie Anderson and everything that he was going through. Remember, there was just a lot of like mystery surrounding yeah. 
Freddie Anderson last season when he missed time. Remember, they were calling it a lower body injury. And I think it ended up um, being revealed that it was his knee or yeah. something like that. But I Freddie, to, to be fair to Freddie, Freddie genuinely didn't look right. You could, you could tell by his body language, like how he was moving around that he did look like something was bothering him. But I remember the same, the same questions were being brought up. Like, is, is Freddie really that injured? What's going mm-hmm. on here? Could there yeah. be something else going on that's not related to an injury? And people are going to speculate all the time. But with Jack Campbell, who the hell knows? Because clearly this dude has lost his confidence. He's not the same goalie he was last season at the beginning of this season. And the goaltending has been a complete joke. And I go over these stats every single podcast just to update everybody. Since December 1st, a span of 36 games, the Leafs have a team save percentage of 883 that ranks 29th in the NHL. And they have an 887 save percentage at five on five, ranking 31st in the NHL. That's a span of 36 games. So they've only, they've played 59. So mm-hmm. 36 out of those 59 games, they have been getting an 883 save percentage. I forget which month it was, but someone posted their save percentage month by month. And there was only one where they were over 900. The only reason why you look at their team save percentage, and I'm getting, it's getting lower and lower and lower with every game, but why it's not absolutely and truly pathetic is because there was one month where they had like a nine, four, five or nine, five, four or something. But other than that, everything's been below 900. Yeah. And that's when Campbell was going nuclear at the start yeah. of the season. He had like a nine forty save percentage. At one point it was like nine fifty. Like yeah, he was playing out of his mind at the beginning of the season. I think that's what led to that really good save percentage in October and even going into November. But since the start of December, it has been a complete mess. And it's like you said, I don't know if Mark Andre Fleury is going to really fix anything. I know it's Mark Andre Fleury, huge name. You know, he's won Stanley Cups. He's got the pedigree and all that. We all know how how good Mark Andre Fleury can be. But you said it, man. It's not like he's having this banner season with the Chicago Blackhawks. I wouldn't yeah. be too confident just plugging him in, even though it is Mark Andre Fleury and expecting him to deliver you know, like a 915, a 920 save percentage. Yeah. And then even the lower guys, it's a playoffs. It's an experience thing. They brought up Forsberg's name. I think it was on Sportsnet, Forsberg from the Sens. And yeah, the guy's been great. He's having a great year, but I'm not going to be jumping up and down celebrating that we solved the problem if we picked up a guy who went through waivers like four times last year, right? And go- man, goalies are goalies are so weird. Someone posted the other day on Twitter. I wish I would have snapped it to see the exact list they had. But you think about recent goalies. And even from last year to two years ago to this year, look at Freddie. Freddie, last year, we wanted him gone. Like, it wasn't even a discussion as to whether or not the Toronto Maple Leafs were going to try to re-sign him. He's having a Vezina caliber season. Tristan Jari was pathetic in last year's playoffs. He was going to get run out of Pittsburgh this year. Incredible. Jack Campbell finished the season incredibly last year. Started the season uh, putting up numbers that would win a Vezina trophy. Now he's fallen off a cliff. It's nuts, man. It's nuts how up and down these goalies are. Like the word everyone uses is voodoo. That's the right word. You can't make any sense of these goalies. Even Mrazek, like make all the jokes you want. His history shows he's an NHL goal. He's a solid NHL goal. He's having the worst season of his career, right? Oh, by far, not even close. I I said before on this show, a friend of mine is a high-end goalie coach. And when he was drafted, the Red Wings thought they had Carey Price. But I, I, I don't know what to say. And to me, and now here's like the gluttons for punishment rant of the day. This whole thing is just so Toronto Maple Leafs. And I'll tell you why. I'm always very quick to say that I love the Toronto Maple Leafs. I am proud to call myself a Toronto Maple Leafs fan. I've cheered for this team since I was a little boy and I will cheer for them for the rest of my life. But at the end of the day, when I'm really and truly honest with myself, Being a Maple Leafs fan is not fun. It's never fun. Very rarely have we been able just to sit back and enjoy the show. 
I was talking to a friend of mine who's a big Leafs fan, and he pointed he pointed out, and he was right. The last time we had a real and true fun season was Matthews' rookie year because expectations were low. The team was young, exciting, winning. They made the playoffs, went out in the first round against the President's Trophy champion, uh, Washington Capitals, but pushed them to six. It was a great effort. They got cheered off the ice. That season, we had a great time. Since then, there's always been something. There's always been drama. There, there was the Babcock shit and the guy that like, was trying to get rid of contracts like Marlowe's and who's going to sign, who's not going to sign the Nylander thing. There's always something in Leafland. This year, the team went out, started with that bad start. But since that bad start, the Leafs looked great. Matthews and Marner firing on all cylinders. Bunting, Kasha, Kampf looking like great additions. Jack Campbell having the season he was having. Keith tying was he tied Toe Blake for one of the best starts to a coaching career in NHL history. Things looked great. This team was on base for, I think, like 120 points at one point. God forbid. God forbid. We were having a good time. So the man upstairs just said, sorry, this can't happen. This isn't allowed, Maple Leafs fans. You have to be miserable and be panicking. It just, it is what it is. Someone in the comments down below, <laughs> comments down below, someone try to convince me that this team's not cursed. Try, try to convince me. I hope you can because I, I'm fully convinced this team is just cursed. I know the team is cursed when I look at Michael Hutchinson's numbers from a few years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, Michael Hutchinson, everyone in Leafs Nation jokes around about how terrible this guy was. And oh my God, when, when the Leafs, remember, he goes to Colorado, then the Leafs bring him back, and people are like, oh, my God, Michael Hutchinson is back. What a disaster. So in oh, that season where he was a complete train wreck. I knew you were going to go here. <laughs> 15 games, he had an 886 save percentage. Okay. Peter Morazic right now through 17 games, 884 save percentage. 884. He somehow has a worse save percentage than Michael Hutchinson in that Michael Hutchinson just nightmare season where he couldn't stop a puck. What was Sparks? Sparks had that pathetic year too. I'm sure that's. Oh pretty, yeah. Sparks, I think was, was probably very, very similar under to that. I should look that up real quick. Yeah. Under 900 for sure. Yeah. Garrett Sparks. I remember Leafs nation thought he was like the next coming of Carey price at one point. Well, he won. What did he win? He won. HL Didn't best he, when goalie. He, went, he won goalie of the year in the AHL. Yeah, won the Calder Cup, all that. The whole thing is his first game with the Leafs, he got a shutout and he cried. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, he had cool pads. So that got everyone excited. So Garrett Sparks, 2015-2016. This was the year before Matthews, Marner, and Nylander arrived. 17 games, 893 save percentage. Okay. And then... He played 20 games for the Leafs in 2018, 2019. So this is like in the middle of the Matthews and Marner era. Uh, 20 games played 902 save percentage. Oh, there you go. So Mrazek has been worse than all of those seasons from Michael Hutchinson and Garrett Sparks. And just to put a, a bow on this goalie conversation for all the people that, you know, are, are dying to bring in Marc-Andre Fleury. Mark Andre Fleury, 43 games played this year, a, a 908 lot. save percentage. Mm. Jack Campbell, Michael Lapore, in 40 games played this year as well, a 914 save percentage. Jack yeah. Campbell is at a 914, and Mark Andre Fleury's at 908. As terrible as Campbell has been since the start of December, and he has been really bad. He still has a better save percentage than Mark Andre Fleury this season. So yeah, the Fleury thing, the, the the Fleury thing is just too dramatic. It's just way too dramatic and shocking, and it, it'll blow up in the Leafs' face again because we're cursed. But it, it's just not going to happen that Fleury's going to come in and be a superstar in the playoffs and steal games. It just it won't happen. It won't happen. And, and I think the management knows that. They know they're they're banking on a coin flip and uh, and what you'd have to give up. Don't do it. Yeah, do it. with the volatility of goaltending these days, I think management would much rather give up significant assets to bring in a really good defenseman exactly. or another top six forward. And if they are going to bring in a goalie, which I'm sure they are looking at, I think they would rather go the route of bringing in an Anton Forsberg 
or someone yeah. on that level who you can pick up for, you know, pennies on, I don't want to say pennies on the dollar because it's not like this guy sucks. Like Anton Forsberg's had a great season, but you're not going to have to give up the assets you would have to give up to acquire a Mark andre Fleury. And I just yeah. think it makes way more economical sense, just makes more logical sense, really. And I, I think Dubis is too smart to just go all in on Mark andre Fleury, who honestly, who knows what he's going to provide this team if he does come in here. Yeah, the thing is with a Forsberg too, you can just, the plan can just be to get him. And then you see how things go for the last 20, 20 games of the season between the three of them. So, and if it, you end up with Campbell uh, as your starter in the playoffs, well, you picked up some goalie depth and you probably had to give up like a second or third for it or something. So it's not the end of the world. What I find hilarious, Leafs fans, let's uh, move back for a second. Remember last summer when we all said to ourselves and screamed on Twitter that we would not give a shit about this regular season, <laughs> that it didn't matter, that we were done getting upset. We were done caring about the regular season because all that mattered was the playoffs. Now, I know people are freaked out right now because this may spill into the playoffs, but we're liars. We're all liars. We care way too much. Come Breaking on, news, Lapore. Leaf fans care. Yeah. Breaking news. Fuck. All these Leaf fans, and I, I know several Leaf fans who literally told me this face to face, saying they're not going to watch this team in the regular season. Yeah. They don't give a shit until the playoffs start. <laughs> but there's a lot of people that care, including yeah. those people who told me that they weren't going to watch and didn't care about the regular season. They are sure tuning in each and every night and getting pissed off watching these goalies allow four or more goals every single game. So yeah, yeah it, it's hilarious. We, we just love, we love to punish ourselves. I mean, gluttons for punishment. I mean, what else can we say, but yeah, we'll see what happens with this goaltending situation. Um, whether the Leafs address it at the upcoming trade deadline, whether they decide to just weather the storm. And I even think back to last season, I believe, or was it the season before when they picked up David Riddick? It was last year. That was last year, right? So yeah, it, 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 it kind of reminds me of that where maybe they just pick up like a David Riddick type goaltender to just bring him in as an, as an insurance policy. So we'll see what happens, Lapore. but I'm on the same page as you. I, I don't think bringing in Marc-Andre Fleury really is the answer as much as people want to see that happen. But I think it's time to move on now and talk yeah, about just, something other than just, this. Dreadful Just to put the tenure. cherry on the flurry thing, there is also that part of me that I announced on this podcast that I'd give away a flurry jersey if he did get picked up. So I'm not in the mood to spend like two, three hundred bucks on that. So please, leave so let it happen for my sake. If, if you don't want to do it for, or if you want to do it for the uh, the fans in your organization, think about it for a second and try to help your boy Lapore out. It's time for a quick break for a word about Manscaped, the champions of below the waist grooming, and our proud sponsors who have done it again with the launch of the brand new Ultra Premium Collection. From trimming your hockey pucks to your everyday grooming and hygiene routine, Manscaped is here. After lighting the lamp, hit the showers with this all-in-one skin and hair care kit that covers you from head to toe. Manscaped is trust below the waist, and now it's time to trust them with the rest. Join the 4 million men worldwide who used Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20. Lapore, these products are the best. They are the best, Anthony Bruno. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are hockey players and we all spend time in the locker room. Nobody wants to look like an ape, guys, in the locker room. So get that lawnmower 4.0, take it to your body, finish it up with the shampoo and conditioner and the body wash so you look great and you smell great. You said it, Lepore. You want to look good and feel good when you're playing hockey. So you play good. Very important. All right, everybody, get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping using the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. Don't be a goon. Upgrade your hygiene routine with the ultra premium collection from Manscaped. All right. Lapore, we have to talk about uh, NHL officiating because sure. there was a, a, a big, big um, 
explosive, if you want to call it, explosive on Twitter, I guess, situation when Jacob Chikrin in overtime against Austin Matthews held his stick and kind of dragged him down. And then Chikrin comes in and buries the game winning goal. And Leaf fans are up in arms. Matthews is yelling at the refs. It's very, you know, it's very rare to see Matthews become that heated especially at the referees. And it was, it was crazy to see. It was clearly a penalty. And you think back to Ovechkin hooking Zach Hyman when Zach Hyman had an empty net, Oilers, uh, Capitals, and that wasn't called. And then TJ Oshie ends up tying the game late. The Oilers end up winning that game in overtime. But, you know, then you even look at that Senators Vegas Golden Knights game where Thomas Shabbat gets called for a trip leading to Jack Eichel scoring a power play goal to win the game with like six seconds left on the clock. So, I mean, I'm sure people can go through a ton of different situations this year where similar things have happened, but these things have all happened recently within the last week to two weeks. So Laporte, what the hell, man? Like what can the NHL do here to fix this? Especially, you know, looking at that Matthews call, like it's a clear penalty. Yeah. That, that leads to an overtime win for the opponent. So what can the NHL do to address this? See, we've said a million times on the show that we don't like talking about refs. So my kind of, my path to it is more an NHL thing. People are, are always quick to point and yell at officials when mistakes are made, whether it's a call or a non-call. I don't think I'm being illogical when I say that referees aren't doing a bad job on purpose when they make a mistake it's because they didn't have a clear view or they miss saw something in those three examples you gave i'm sure if you showed the referees who made or did not make those calls slow motion replays of what happened they would have made the different call the holding on matthews had the referee been close to it seeing the hold he would have put his arm up shabbat the player did not trip over his stick the player tripped on his own from the referee's viewpoint i'm sure he saw a foot close to a stick and the player fall in the case of the hyman ovechkin one more of the same i'm sure he just saw two guys battling for the puck so to me the issue is not necessarily oh, the referees suck. It's like, guys, no, these are the best referees in the world. I just don't see how the NHL cannot want to make changes with regard to what is available to the teams concerning challenges and replays for the officials. What I don't understand in sports altogether is whenever we have these discussions, there are people who argue against more replay and more access for the officials why don't you want to get it right? Why? I remember, like, I'm a big soccer fan, and I remember when VAR came in for offside, people flipping out, going nuts. So you'd rather see, it was all, it takes integrity away from the game. It takes power away from the refs that you do this now and these calls that are a few inches. So you'd rather have the World Cup winning goal be actually offside than just have a system that works, but you had to wait 30 seconds for someone to watch a replay. So that's where I lie with it. The NHL has to make some changes with regard to the rules and how teams can challenge or how certain plays are reviewed. The way I see it is do it this way. Do it like soccer and VAR, where every goal scored is reviewable. It will be automatically reviewed, like the NFL. Same thing. Every scoring play gets the review. So in the case of the Chikrin goal, they would look at it and be like, no, 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 no. Chikrin held up Matthews. It doesn't count. So in the case of non-calls, that saves the day. In the case of, say, what happened to Shabbat, have a coach's challenge. Again, what's wrong with the situation where Shabbat can run over to DJ Smith and say, no, 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 I wasn't close to him. Throw the flag to challenge it. It gets challenged. The referee goes to the monitor. Five-second review. No trip. Move on. And if the team's wrong, do the whole thing. They get a penalty for delay of game or something. What would the argument be against that? The Oilers won. Thank God they won. Thank God they won. Because that one was even worse than the hold on Matthews. 
that one was absolutely crazy. That was the, that kind of hook was something they put in the hockey Canada video for referees saying, this is the definition of hooking in the sport of hockey. Absolutely crazy. But to me, we have the technology. We didn't have it before. We have the access. We can do things quickly. It's, it makes the game look bad. Horrible. These things make the game look horrible. We're trying to attract fans. Try to attract a fan when you show them shit like that. Get it right. I don't understand. Why don't they want to just have a system that gets it right? And you're not taking anything away from the referees. We're just acknowledging, yeah, it's a hard job. The game's gotten way faster. And I'll put it this way. Make it like soccer, where for a play to be changed, it had the, the terminology they use is clear and obvious error. So let's say the Shabbat one, if that was to be reviewed, they look, the, a penalty being called was a clear and obvious error. His foot wasn't near his stick. Reverse it. If it's one of those ones where it's close, you know, his, his stick was there, but actually how much influence did it have on the player going down? No, the trip, it's a trip. But when it's drastic, like those three examples, make it so people can do something about it, man, because it's gross. And I'm going to say the Don Cherry thing. If we get that playoff in overtime or something like that, a team gets eliminated, it's horrible. It's bad for the sport. And like I said, we're trying to attract fans. We're trying to keep fans. Why not just get it right? And that's it right there. For the love of God, just get it right. And I, I look at the, the NFL, right, especially with all the pass interference and things like that. Mm. And I know they changed the rule where now they've gone back to not reviewing pass interference. Yeah. And, and that's that. just been a, you know, a disaster on its own. And we even saw in the Super Bowl um, when T Higgins had that long touchdown and he essentially like, Oh, the face mask, the yeah. face mask on Jalen Ramsey. Right. And you know, like it, it's stuff like that. Like just get it right. And it's like, you know, you, you, you go back to the examples that I talked about in the NHL. You have a star player, a guy who is probably going to win the Hart Trophy this year in Austin Matthews, who's in an overtime game, and he's just blatantly getting held by Jacob Chikrit. Mm -hmm. And again, things happen really fast. The game of hockey is a lot faster now than it was 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But you're telling me that we can't take a minute to two minutes, as annoying as it might be sometimes, to just review these things, especially on, on scoring plays, especially on overtime scoring plays. The Matthews, you know, the infraction on Matthews, Alexander Ovechkin blatantly hooking Zach Hyman, like just a blatant hook on Zach Hyman. Like, how does that not get called? These are things that should easily be reviewable and be able to be changed, especially when it's a scoring play, especially when it's a big moment in the game. The last thing you would want is being in the Stanley Cup final and, you know, you're in overtime, whether it's a, an elimination game, whether it's game one or game two of the cup final, and there's just a, a blatant missed call where, you know, God forbid a star player, you know, name the star player, whoever's playing in the cup final this year just gets hauled down in overtime, no call. The other team walks in and scores. You're telling me the NHL can't take two minutes to review something like that to get it right? Yeah. It, it's insane. And I know all of these examples have all happened very recently, and it has people very heated. But I think this is probably a, the kick of the ass that the NHL needs to go into those board of governors meetings and whatever they do with the, the competition committee in the offseason and, and figure out a way to address this and just to make it right. Yeah, the thing is, too, the way I see it, and I'll get your opinion, Bruno, and comment down below what you guys think. I think it'd be really easy with hockey because you, you gave the NFL examples, things like pass interference and, you know, the classic one, what is a catch? There is gray there because, like, you have hand fighting. You, it's not like you could, there's no body contact allowed. And then with the catch, we can argue all day long on what is and what is not. But in hockey, most cases have to do with a stick so like in matthew's case chikrin held his stick i'll use the words i used before clear and obvious he held his stick and then on the opposite side of of a call that shouldn't have been a call the shabbat one it's a stick knocking feet out that is the rule of tripping you look at it that didn't happen it's an easy call and even again like i touched on like for the good of the game 
here you have this game, the home team down four to one. They come roaring back two goals in 10 seconds. A goalie gets put in. It's his first NHL game. He's playing great. The crowd's getting behind him. Three on three overtime, was, which, which is an amazing thing the NHL did. Back and forth action. And that's how the game was won. That's it. We were robbed of a great result. Heck, if the Leafs lose, the Leafs lose. Got nothing to do with that. But let it play out. Again, what a story that game would have been. Had the Leafs won and this goalie gets his first win that way or in a shootout makes three saves or and again if if uh if, uh arizona was able to score a legitimate goal and was able to like overcome having uh, a three goal lead blow up in their face to me that's just, that's just what's so brutal about it and again being a leaf fan watching it live sitting on the couch wife next to me you clearly see matthews being held up and then the play continues and i hear i'm screaming that's a penalty that's a penalty that's a penalty as Arizona's entering the zone, out loud, Bruno. I'm like, well, they're going to score now. They have hockey gods. They have to score now. Just bang one, di- yeah, bang one timer goal because of the Leafs. Just horrible. Welcome, yeah, to the, welcome it's to the brutal. Party. The NHL needs to address this in the off season, and knowing the NHL, they probably won't address it because that's what happens a lot of the a lot of the times with this league where they're just not ahead of the curve when you compare the NHL to whether it's the NFL, the NBA, whoever, right? They, they always seem to be a step behind the curve, even soccer for that matter with VAR. But we'll see what happens. Hopefully nothing egregious like this happens in the playoffs that leads to a result that should not have happened. But we'll see because it's the NHL and you know come playoff time, Lepore, Basically, anything is possible. You can cross-check dudes in the head, in the neck. You can two-hand guys in the leg right in front of the referee, and the refs just don't care because it's playoff hockey, right? That's how it's kind of always been. So we'll see what happens down the home stretch of the season and then leading into the playoffs. But I have a feeling that nothing is going to change, (laughs) at least right now. All right, Lepore, let's move on to the next game. And we don't have to get into the details of the heritage classic. We all know what happened. Like Peter Morazic was <laughs> terrible again. He lets in that goal from, from the goal line, which <sighs> I just, you know, I wasn't even surprised seeing that because I'm just like, well, Peter Morazic guy has no confidence. Same with Jack Campbell. Can't stop a beach ball right now. Of course he lets in a goal literally from the goal line. So that, that's that where, was, that that's was where we are now, and, Bruno. That's where we are now. It's to the point where we're not even surprised when one of those goes in just, yeah, par for the course, move on. It, it's brutal, man. But I'll tell you this, the, the thing that sticks out to me most from the heritage classic is seeing Kyle Dubas and Brendan Shanahan in the box, in the box yeah. wearing their, their cool heritage classic hats, yeah. just chilling there looking like, looking like two gangsters, if you will. And uh, they were just, they were, they looked miserable. Yeah. They looked, uh, you know, almost at a loss, at a loss for words. And obviously they're not going to be up there, you know, going crazy and getting all emotional because they know that's going to get caught on camera. But I think they're just, they have the same feelings as, as us and the rest of, of, you know, Leafs nation that it's like, no matter what this team does, no matter how well this team plays, the goaltending is, is, is a complete train wreck and it's holding this team back. And it's almost like you throw your hands in the air. What are you supposed to do here? Because they, I, I guarantee you, they were never thinking about having to go out at the uh, at the trade deadline and pick up a goalie. And now they're they're almost they're they're almost forced to at this point. So that's what sticks out to me most: just seeing Dubas and Shanahan, and they're just kind of the blank stares on their faces as the Leafs lose another game to a shit team that they should have beaten. Yeah, awesome. Just awesome and again the leafs outdoor game all the fans new shiny jerseys reason to be excited i I think we all had a bad feeling i I think we all had a bad feeling because it was buffalo we just thought it was just so such a perfect script for buffalo to come in and ruin this party and it happened but yeah dubis's body language as subtle as it was as you pointed out says everything it's like where the fuck am i is what he's thinking here. I built this team. I was able to get Nick Ritchie out the door. 
coming towards the deadline. Now I have to have this new focus. Terrible, man. Terrible. And yeah, I just, uh, uh, Shanahan, I'm uh, to be a fly on the wall, man, because I don't know. I guess we can talk about it since those guys have come in since Dubas has been GM. It seemed like everything was always pretty black and white at the deadline. You kind of knew what the Leafs were always going to add, whether it was a forward, a defenseman, a vet, like the year they added Boyle and then Placanic, Felino last year. You could see those moves coming, and they made sense. They were they were clear. But in this case, they're not. So I feel I feel sorry for this for for these guys. I really do because with this goaltending thing, there are so many questions. There's no sure thing out there. There's not that many goalies available. So. It's a tough one, but again, book books, a lot of books are written about the Leafs, and this is just another chapter that will be be a plus entertainment. Yeah, we're we're never short for entertainment when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs. There's always something going on with this team, and like I said earlier in the show, on pace for a franchise record 110 points, but yet people are terrified. People have no idea what's going on with this goalie situation. People are stressed out right now. And this team is on pace to shatter the franchise record by five points. In and this is after season. they're a losing streak, Bruno. It's think of that for a second. 110 point. If someone would have told you beginning of the season at this point, the Leafs would put this stretch together and still be on pace for 110 points. No way. No way. We'd be like, oh, they're fighting for a playoff spot. <laughs> is, is what we would have said. Just terrible. There was also the stat too. Again, back to what I said about this season being fun. I remember there was a span where the Leafs had lost like five games out of 20 or 25 or something. And in those five, in each and every one of those five games, they had at least 35 shots on goal games. where they had 45, 50 shots on goal. So they were essentially playing amazing every night and winning. And the only nights they wouldn't win is when the other team's goalie would stand on his head. And that's just hockey. So it is what it is. There was nothing to be scared about nothing. And now it's piling up piece by piece, brick by brick. We're freaking the hell out, man. All eyes are going to be on Kyle Dubas over the next week. And it's been Dubas's MO to make moves before the actual trade deadline. He doesn't True. like making moves the day of the deadline. When he picked up Felino, I believe the Felino deal was the day of the NHL trade deadline. It was either the day or the day before, but I can't remember. But I even think back to when he acquired Jack Campbell and Jake Muzzin. Yeah, that was not on the trade deadline. I believe that was like a week to two weeks before the deadline. Yeah, maybe pick those guys yeah. up from Los Angeles. So it's been Dubas's MO to act early. So, you know, if you're looking ahead to the trade deadline, I would say be ready for something to happen for the Leafs before the actual deadline. But who knows? This could go to the 11th hour when they're trying to make their decision in terms of you know, unloading assets for what they need most and determining whether that's a defenseman, a goalie, a forward. We'll leave that up to them to decide, but it's going to be a very interesting next week in Leafs Nation. Lapore, one other big thing from the Heritage Classic was Austin Matthews, who got into it at the end of the game with Sabres defenseman Rasmus Dahlin, and, you know, I go back to that Coyotes game. You had Matthews yelling at the referees for the non-call when Chikrin held his stick. And then he got super heated with Rasmus Dahlin. And you never see Math- Matthews do, do stuff like this. He cross-checked Dahlin in the neck. Now, mm-hmm. whether he actually meant to cross-check him right in the neck area, I, I don't think he did because he he talked about it actually in his press conference where he's like, I kind of cross-checked him in the shoulder and it rode up on me and it, you know, it hits the hits him in the neck. And again, you know, you Doesn't can't matter, make any yeah. excuses for Matthews. He did what he did. He cross-checked Dowling right in the neck. Like it was a it was a pretty, it was a pretty bad cross-check. And now he is facing a hearing with the NHL Department of Player Safety. At the time of recording, we do not yet know the results of that hearing. Um, It appears that Matthews is most likely going to get suspended, whether it's one game, two games. But, you know, I just think back to the Montreal series and how Matthews got pushed around by the Habs and, you know, Ben Sherrod, Joel Edmondson, Shea Weber, doing whatever the hell they wanted, not only to Austin Matthews, but to the rest of the Leafs. 
And you know what? Even though Matthews is probably going to get suspended, Lapore, I like seeing passionate Austin Matthews. I like seeing the Austin Matthews who gives a shit and who fights back. And I'm not saying he's got to drop the, the gloves and, and pull like a Jerome Aginla, you know, Captain Jerome Aginla, who not only could score 50 goals, but he'll fight someone when he has to, right? I'm not saying Matthews has to do that, but I like seeing this fire from Austin Matthews. And you know what? If he gets one or two games, I don't really care because yeah. He's frustrated right now. Yes, he's having a great season, and you don't want to see that derailed by a suspension. But I like seeing the fight in Austin Matthews and and standing up for himself and his team right now. 100%. I think that was kind of the take of most Leafs fans. We're, of course, scared that we're going to see a suspension and lose him for a game, two games, who knows. But at the same time, we were like, fuck yeah, play angry, be mad, get pissed off, play pissed off. And even too, there was that there was that incident with Bunting, that other one with Mikheyev. I loved it. This team, like this has been a bad portion of their season. I'm sure there's a lot of frustration internally. Here you have this game. And let, let's call it how it is. The players must hate these outdoor games. On the mic. Oh, it's just like a kid playing on the outdoor rink. I hate to break it to everyone, but today's hockey player doesn't have the story about playing in their on their father's backyard rink in Saskatchewan. They're at elite hockey academies in the GTA. So it's completely different. These guys have never been on an outdoor rink their entire life. And it's, it's cold. It's windy. The ice is shit. It's yesterday. It was snowing. Imagine being a goalie and it's snowing or it's like trying try to stick handle, make a move. It, it, like there's snow going up on your stick. Brutal. It's professional hockey. And like, we all know why the league does it, but. I think just add that to the pile of, you know, the Leafs being a little agitated on how they're playing. Now they're freezing, they're cold, they're losing to a team they should beat. I know they were the away team, but they were the home team. It was all their fans and they got pissed off and all boiled over. And I loved it. Show it. And like you said, we don't need to see Matthews drop the gloves, but well, he, no one tell me now he doesn't care. And how Bunting went in, like I said, that scrap with Mikheyev. Awesome. Awesome. And I, I hate that we're at this point, like as hockey fans all together, that that stuff sort of excites us and gets us, you know, more positive about our team's chances at playoff success. But at the end of the day, it's the reality. Fans are going to love to see it. It's passion. It's hatred. You want to hate that other team. And again, I think the best saying is you want to see your team get play pissed off. And if we're being honest with ourselves, one thing we can say about this Leafs team is that when it came to playoff time, this team didn't play pissed off or it was just a matter of the other team being more pissed off than we were, especially those Columbus and Bruins series. So I liked it. I'm okay with it. Whatever Matthews gets, he gets, but it sounds kind of weird, but I'm okay with the trade-off of seeing that passion, that emotion. And maybe it was a wake up call to this team that they need. Like, I hate to be the guy who throws in that cheesy line of like, oh, these professional guys need to be, need to be woken up. But maybe it builds in team camaraderie. They got a little fired up and let's go now. Let's go. Yeah, because it's one thing when Wayne Simmons is out there being the agitator and hitting guys and crossing the line a little bit. It's another thing when it's Austin Matthews doing that stuff, when it's your best player, when Michael Bunting, and listen, Michael Bunting has been, getting under the skin of his opponents all season long. He's been excellent at that. I've, I've been loving what he's brought to the table. But when you see Austin Matthews take matters into his own hands, and again, you could say it was stupid and he shouldn't have cross-checked Darlene and it was a dirty play, whatever. I mean, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say it was clean by any means. Like, again, he cross-checked the dude right in the neck and he's probably going to get suspended for it. But it just comes down to the narrative that has surrounded this team for so long and specifically in the Matthews and Marner era that this team is soft. And we've yeah. talked about it on the podcast countless times, especially come playoff time, right? There's other teams. Look at the Habs. They knew last year that they could push around the Leafs to a certain extent. Yeah. And I know there was you know, some, some weird things that happened in the series. John Tavares plays two minutes after he, gets concussed, getting hit in the head by Corey Perry, right? It was completely, it was a complete accident. But, you know, that series, I just remember Shea Weber just chopping guys down, cross-checking Austin Matthews in the back, Ben Sherratt pissing people off and 
getting under the skin of, of Leafs forward. Same thing with Joel Edmondson. And it's just like the Leafs really didn't do anything. And then you, you see that image of Matthews. Remember, he was getting held from behind and he was just kind of smiling. Yeah. And, and I think back to those images, it's like, I don't want to see that again in the playoffs. I want to see what you said, Lapore. I want to see this team play pissed off. I want to see and us it, doing that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it's not, and it's not, again, it's not Matthews having to go out there and fight anybody, but it's like, show some passion, show a little bite, show some edge to your game. Besides everything else that you do mix in a little bit of the crap that you see from like guys like Brad Marchand or even Sidney Crosby, yeah. like Sidney Crosby plays pissed off. Yep. Right. I want to see a little bit of that. And, and it was good to see that from Austin Matthews, but Lepore, is, is there anything else you want to get off your chest about this Leaf team? How many games has he got, Bruno? I think he's going to get, I think he's going to get two. Okay. And I, I'm, I heard Kelly Rudy talking about this um, after the, after the game, the, the Sportsnet panel was kind of, they were kind of going around and asking how many games and, and he was like, listen, because it's Austin Matthews and he's a star, I believe it was Kelly Rudy who said this. He goes, he, he should probably get more, but he's probably only going to get two. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there's probably some people who think he's going to get less than two, but I'm, I'm going to go with two games. What do you think? I'm thinking one. I'm one thinking one, one and a fine okay. is what it is. And he, he, got, he gets a talking to just the list, right? No previous suspensions. He's a superstar. Yeah, I mean, people are going to flip out and say it's because he plays for the Leafs. But, like, I always laugh with that stuff. People act like it's a benefit to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, no, guys, it's the opposite. They want to stick it to us all the time. But uh, I'll say one, and uh, maybe maybe I'm the one with wishful thinking now. Uh, but I'm just thankful Darlene wasn't hurt. I mean, for more reasons than one, I like the kid and I hope he wasn't hurt, but for Matthew's sake, because if, if Darlene goes to the ice after a cross check to the neck and he's out now we're in trouble and you can debate about that one all day long about hockey and penalties and suspensions. It's saying it shouldn't matter whether or not the player gets hurt, but I actually heard Shanahan once he was on an interview, he was doing an interview and this is when he was sheriff Shani, he was a head of player disciplinary and someone asked him that he was on a Rangers show and the host asked him, why does it matter if the player is hurt? It should be based on the action. And Shanahan's response was, and I never thought of it this way. He said, you go to a bar, you punch a guy in the face. You guys get pulled outside, you get thrown out. What happens really at the end of the day? Exact same situation. You punch the guy, he hits his head on the bar and he dies. Now you're going to jail. And he said, that's, that's how they treat it in hockey. So for Matthew's sake, Thank God Darlene wasn't hurt, and I'm sure the alert will come to our phones shortly about what he's going to get. Um, I expect to see it by the end of the day. The, the, the hearing was today, right, this morning? or Yeah, yeah, his hearing is today. Yeah, so we'll find out shortly and find out whether or not he'll be in the lineup against Dallas. Yeah, by the time this podcast actually gets posted, we will probably have a result, and yeah. we'll see whether it's one, two games, and maybe – he doesn't even get suspended. I think that's highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. But uh, by the time this podcast goes up, we will probably have an answer from the NHL Department of Player Safety. But uh, we will wait and see, and we will be checking Twitter every five seconds. But uh, before, before we wrap up this podcast, anything else you have on your mind when it comes to the Leafs or the NHL? Yeah. I'm going to say what I said on the last show, Bruno. I'm just hoping for our next episode, we have something different to talk about other than the pathetic thing that is the goaltending of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Let us talk about something else because it's hurtful and it's getting boring. So guys, 900, it's all we ask for. 900, we'll be okay with that. And we can move on and talk about some other things, trade deadline stuff, creeping up to the playoffs. Give us a chance, man. Give us a chance. Please, for the love of God, just, just give the Leafs average goaltending. Yeah. They have now allowed four or more goals in six consecutive games. It's just, it's a complete disaster. And I hope 
they find a way to get out of this tailspin. And who knows? Maybe, maybe it is Eric Schalgren. I mean, who the hell knows at this point? I, I'm down for any goalie to come in here and provide 900 plus save percentage at this point. So we'll see what happens. Um, just looking at the Leafs' upcoming schedule, they have the Dallas Stars on Tuesday night at home. Then they play the Hurricanes at home on Thursday night Perfect. before going to Nashville to play the Predators on Saturday. Okay. So should be an interesting week leading up to the trade deadline, and we can't wait to see what happens. But that is going to do it for episode 55 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, the Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast, hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. Once again, if you enjoyed the show and you're a new listener, head over to Apple, head over to Spotify, give us a five-star rating and review. We would love you for that. And we would appreciate it so, so much, especially if you're watching on YouTube. If you smash that like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So for Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone. Oh, show.